Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Hi, I hope you saw the interview I did with Ed Lattimore the other day, where we talked about making wisdom intelligible and, and some other things. Now, a uh, funny thing about that interview is that Ed and I had been talking uh, bef before we got started, and then I started recording, but then we just continued with the conversation we'd been having. And that kept going, actually, for quite a while. Um, close to 40 minutes or so before I finally, uh, took a break to, um, you know, pause to actually do a proper introduction and get on to the actual, um, subject I had, you know, asked him that I could interview him about. Um, so I want to take this, uh, stuff, the, the first stuff that happened, um, and sort of present that as a bonus because on different subjects, interesting subjects, I think, and Ed's cool with that. So, um, here you go. Here's the conversation Ed and I were having before the interview. Let me start. But, you know, it's funny. I was talking with, um, with someone who's another math person. And um, there's actually a video I did on um, Bayesian statistics versus frequentist statistics. I don't know if you've ever heard of... It. It's, I know it's a, what, the, what Bayes' theorem is in Bayesian statistics. And I would imagine it's a little... Is it related at all? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It is. It's an interpret... There's... There, there are two sort of interpretations of statistics. Because, um, I mean, the problem with statistics is that in, in frequent statistics, um, which is looking at probabilities as the limits of infinite sequences, mm -hmm. the real world doesn't actually satisfy any of the conditions necessary to apply probability to it. Right. So that's why I joke that statistics is the misapplication of probability to the real world. Because nobody has an infinite run of anything. <laughs> so any theorem that says if you have an infinite run of these things, well, you don't, so you're supposed to stop there. Okay. Uh, Bayesian statistics, by contrast, or the Bayesian interpretation, um, and it's, I think, partially named for Bayes' theorem. I'm not sure it was the... He actually mentioned it, too, because he's really interested... He, he has the math background, too. He's really interested in Bayesian statistics. And I think he said... Um, it's like the Reverend Thomas Bayes, or something. he's actually an English priest, um, who was uh, really interested in betting and how you, you know, to, to bet in the most optimal way. Yeah. Um, as, as an intellectual problem, I believe. And uh, but anyway, um, the Bayesian interpretation is that that probability we're, um, we're not deriving probabilities from uh, the long term trends in, or the trends in infinite series or the limits of infinite series properly, uh, but rather they're simply prior assumptions about the world, largely modeling how confident are we that something will happen. So the, the probability is hmm. a measure of our confidence, not a, you know, not anything more than that. Um, and so Bayesian statistics is, more than anything from what he was saying, um, more about figuring out how to evaluate your prior assumptions rather than your, they call them your priors, but they, the condition, the probability you apply to, to base things, because um, then what they do, uh, you know, as you said, like using base th uh, Bayes theory, which is about you know conditional chaining conditional probabilities, or that's what conditional probability is, but chaining probabilities together, you know, the probability of this given that, mm -hmm. um, that you then run those calculations, see how likely things are to occur, see what actually does occur, and. To a large degree, what you can then do is go back and figure out that you were probably wrong about your priors. So is Bayesian more of a experimental base, and the other one, what was it, frequent? Frequentist. Frequentist statistics is more theoretic. Um, they're they're two, they're attitudes more than anything else, because everybody uses the same formulas. Okay. Um, it's just a Bayesian will happily say, I'm guessing the probability of this is 0.137, whereas a frequentist will want some sort of process that they can model in terms of long-term limits. Okay. I um, was trying to explain that to a kid. I, I, uh, one of the kids I tutored, and I was like, oh, the, the idea, we was teaching her about ratios and, uh, odds and probability of one thing happening, all in a context of betting, which is a great way to teach anything related to probability. Yeah. And I would say well, what, the, what this is really saying is that if you could do somehow do this an infinite number of times, it would approach 
uh, the, the frequency of one thing happening versus the other thing would approach this number. That's all this is saying. So like use your like use your imagination and imagine it happening forever. And then I was, and I, I didn't even bother trying to explain the concept of like things don't have a memory because that gets oh yeah deeper. you know teaching kids mm. stuff is really fun because you have to figure out what they need to know but you don't want to shortchange it and make sure they just memorize stuff so it's it's a fun dance between how much theory and how much application because you, I don't, you never. I, I, at least I don't believe so. Uh, I don't think you ever want to bog down a new mom with theory. You want to like, like. There's a whole thing I read about, like why do so many kids stick with a piano over a violin? Uh, because oh. the piano is so much, it, you, you, so much faster to hear a good result with less effort. So, the, so that success. People like to see an early success, and it goes, oh, mm. something's great, I'm going to keep going. And that's the same thing I think, like, I think that's one of the, the problems with teaching math is, like, right around, every. I think everyone, everyone feels good right until you start algebra. And then at that, that's the first shift to an abstract idea like what do you mean a how is that a letter it means something else and now you're not just doing a little concrete so you can like some so knowing that right i don't think we like i think we algebra could eat somewhat of an overhaul but not much i think kid parents gotta step in but the whole idea is like yeah it's there well, this infinity idea and i didn't even want to like i mean she gets infinity is like i think we all do is just the word but like it's not like she's had a what did she say? An abstract uh, algebra or real analysis. It's really, uh, right. Oh yeah. It's not like she's had real analysis or anything like that. But. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. By the way, have you ever um, have you ever seen any of uh, the the orders of infinity stuff like Gayar Cantor's? No. Work? Fasc- probably the most fascinating part of mathematics, um, and very very simple. Really incredibly simple, actually. Um, the uh, so, so uh, the, the way it was introduced to me, and it's amazing how, how quickly you can do this. Um, if you have two piles of things, the condition for them having the same number of things in them is if you can line them up where for each one there's one on the other side, you know, mm-hmm. you need correspondence, you know, and properly speaking, if you could have a function which is one to one and on to. Yeah. But, you know, just line them up next to each other, and if there's one for each one, there you go, they're the same number of. Of rocks, you know, the, the example of like the sheep, you know, sheep going out, you put rock, a rock into the pile for each sheep that goes out, and the sheep come in, you take a rock off the pile, if there's anything left, you're missing a sheep. It's straightforward, really, really simple, just incredibly intuitive. Um, but if you generalize that to a one to one and onto function, you can then look at larger sets, like the natural numbers and the even numbers. Now, intuitively, there should be more natural numbers than even numbers, right? Because the even numbers are a strict subset of the natural numbers. Mm-hmm. And yet, if you map everything to, you know, x to 2x, so, you know, 1 to 2, 2 yeah. to 4, 3 to 6, and so on, there is no even number that you've left out. Every even number comes from somewhere. And there's no natural number that's that doesn't have an even number that it maps to. So x to 2x is a 1 to 1 function, and it's onto. Huh. So in some sense, they're the same number of natural numbers as even numbers, despite the fact that the even numbers are a strict subset. You can actually do the same thing with, um, with the, um, you know, the real numbers, the interval 0 to 1 and the interval 0 to 2. Just map x to 2x. And you've got a 1 to 1 and onto function <laughs> between something which is a strict, you know, which is half the other. And yet oh. there's no number you've left out. For every number in the bigger set, there's one corresponding in the smaller set. For any number, you can point to exactly which one it is. You know, hand me a number in 0 to 2, and I'll just tell you which number it corresponds to in 0 to 1 under that mapping. Man, it's a... Well, that's it's a even, thought exercise. Wow. It is. The really, really screwy one is if you use the arctangent, you can map between 0 and 1 and 0 and positive infinity. I'm sorry, negative infinity to positive infinity. Because the the arc tangent's the one that uh, the the tangent's the one that goes you know like that that like super long S curve mm-hmm. between zero and one yeah or I don't know, it could be 
pi, negative pi, I forget exactly. And then you know, the arc tangent's the one where they're, you know, infinitely many, but if you restrict the range, it goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity. And given the arc tangent, there's a... Um, you can do similar things, actually, in this practice, I think, equivalent to the arc tangent, um, by taking a... Um, uh, um, if you take a quarter turn of a circle, and then um, for each point, take the point uh, that the line tangent to that point on the circle hits, uh -huh. and then, you know, in that quarter turn, it will, you know, between, say, 0 and 1, the tangent will hit every number between 0 and positive infinity. So you can map, you know, zero to, you know, essentially zero to negative one on the quarter turn with the. So zero to one on the quarter turn. Yeah, if you just take the, the quarter turn, take the tangent line, as you're getting towards the top, those tangent lines get really close to parallel. And so there's there's no place out towards infinity that won't be hit. So that, that's a way of right. visualizing they that go same from, thing. Ha ha. Huh. And so in some sense, there's many numbers in that quarter turn of a circle from zero to negative one as there are between zero and positive infinity. Man. So I want to keep thinking about this, like, <laughs> for oh, a long time now. It's fascinating. Um, you can get a one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the rationals. Um, right. That, that that I don't know if it's only because we've been talking about it, but that seems like a really comfortable jump. Yeah, because you can go to, you know, one, then uh, one half, then one third, then two thirds, then one quarter, then two quarters, then three quarters. Yeah. And I so on. Um, and so there's no rational number you'll ever miss. Um, and so there are, you know, and hence you get what are called the orders of infinity. So all of these, you know, like, like the even numbers, the prime numbers, the rational numbers, these all have the order of the natural numbers. The next jump up is, is called the, the order of the continuum, the real numbers. Because you can't do this with the real numbers. You can't come up with a correspondence between the natural numbers and the real numbers. And the, the proof of that is more complex. Um, I, don't, I don't remember how it went. It's one of those proof by contradictions. Like, assume you had one of these things, you can show a number that has been left out somehow. And I forget how you do it. Um, that, that one's more complicated. Um, but the but the real numbers because uh, one way of defining the real numbers is the set of the limits of all possible sequences in the rational numbers, and um, so that actually has a higher order of infinity, um, and, and there's actually a general way that the the superset you know the set of all possible sets mm -hmm. um, has a um, has a higher order than the the set it's the superset of. Um, so no, nobody can, nobody's ever named a, uh, um, n nobody's ever proposed a set with a higher order than the real numbers, a uh, higher order of infinity than the real numbers other than the superset of the real numbers. So you can say the superset of the superset and so on, but other than just saying the superset of, nobody's ever proposed any sort of num you know, like way of looking at those numbers, anything other than being a superset. Um, but yeah, it's really screwed. What's even weirder is the real numbers so the real numbers have a higher, and, and I, I apologize for not having proof for that one. It's a little harder, and I no, no that's fine. I, I I like the general discussion. Of it. Just yeah, there. well, and the real numbers have a higher order of infinity, or, or in another order of infinity, or the next highest order of infinity after the natural numbers. But the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. That is to say, for any two real numbers, you can find a rational number in between them. Right. And yet there are that that makes sense. Yes. That, yeah, that makes intuitive sense. I don't I got I like know the proof or anything. But uh, it's just what whatever the distance is, there's some power of two such that one over two to the, that power is smaller than that distance and so there's gotta be right. in between uh, you know. Um or you know, you might be two to the you know, might there, there's some rational number smaller than like, you know, f um four times the distance and so you know, essentially by the pigeonhole principle, one of those rational numbers has to fit in that distance. Um, yeah, it's, it's real straightforward to prove that the rationals are dense, and yet there are uncountably many irrational numbers and countably many rational numbers. That's right, countable is the order of the natural numbers. There's as many uncountable rational numbers? Well, the, the irrational numbers are uncountable. Right. Which means you can't 
steps that correspondence to the natural numbers, whereas the rational numbers are countable. And so they're uncountably many, they're, you know, higher order of infinity of irrational numbers. And yet, the rational numbers are dense inside of the set that is much bigger than them. It's weird stuff. Mm -hmm. It's huh. really, I, yeah, this is my favorite, you know, in all the years I've studied math, that was my favorite thing was encountering this stuff. Because it's just, the, 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 the way that, that 0 and 1 and 0 and 2 are a strict subset, and yet they're the same number of numbers in the one as the other, I just love that fact so much. On the flip side, and something you were very correct about in math, is that, um, well, even worse, a lot of math is bogged down by about the last 300, 400 years of math teaching history. Um, before the advent of computers, being able to calculate integrals and stuff. Right. Oh, okay, I wonder important. where you're going with this. H hence, two semesters of learning how to um, do, you know, take derivatives and take antiderivatives. Right, which is ridiculous because we now, like... We, Nobody does it in practice. Never. You are your, Not only does no one do it, but no one can do it better than a computer or faster anyway. Instead, I think people should learn. You know, and I just made this connection in my mind a few days ago thinking about this. Uh, calculus is called analytical geometry. Is that right? Or um, no, Analytical geometry is the... Assuming my memory's not, it's been like 10, 12 years since I've been in grad school, something like 10 years since I've been in grad Where school. Where am I getting this no, word? This analytical geometry word. is, well, um, calculus actually generalized into two fields, real analysis and topology. Uh -huh. um, and topology is the study of, of like sets and, and open sets and closed sets and, and various things about sets. Um, real analysis generalized it, actually it took... Um, um, one of the big things was it went from uh, Riemannian integration, you know, which is the uh, yeah you know, the limit of the, the limit of yeah the limit of the approximating rectangles, um, it, uh, into Lebesgue integration, which is um, it generalized you know the distances in the uh, real numbers to simply measure spaces. If you have a space where you have a function with some basic properties, the, the, it, a function from that those sets to the real numbers. Uh, with the property, the, the basic property that like the, um, uh, the the measure of the union of two things can't be smaller than the uh, sum of the measures of the two things. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty obvious stuff. Um, th there's one or two other things like like it's I'm sorry to the positive real numbers in particular is the measure function. So if you have a you know a measure space is, is essentially um, you know a set of numbers um, with a an associated measure function on them. Um, then there is a, you can integrate in general uh, using Lebesgue integration, because rather than, so, I mean, these might be spaces that have no definition of rectangles whatsoever, um, and so what it does, it actually, instead of, uh, whereas Riemannian integration breaks up the domain, you know, into, into smaller and smaller pieces and takes the limit on that, Lebesgue integration does this on the range, and it looks at the inverse image, the, it, it, for the function you have from the measure space into the, the real numbers, it looks at the inverse image. Um, uh, you know, it breaks up the range, then looks at the in, the inverse image and just sums up the measure of that, and then takes the limit as um, as you're subdividing the range. Um, so it actually Lebesgue integration would actually work for things like figuring out how much a bunch of flour would cost you, <laughs> because you know you could you know. The yeah. price of flour, you know, so in different, you know, suppose you had several different size sacks of flour and stuff, and there's, you know, prices on flour, well, that is a measure function, because it, it has, you know, the relevant properties, it goes into the positive real numbers, and so you could actually integrate and figure out the price of all the flour. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, a silly example, but it shows how it's generalized. Yeah. Because you, you can't approximate bags of flour using rectangles. <laughs> um so so it's like that that was um that's real analysis and then oh no no i'm sorry uh i forget what analytic geometry is i was thinking of differential geometry which is actually um i feel like get in physics i feel like i've seen it a lot mentioned uh in that with that name next to it like on trans transcripts or 
Um, what is that tensors word? Tensors come from... Tensor oh, functions tensor come from differential knowledge. geometry. That that's so. Where I, oh, I've, but the, but the I've never done tensors. I just I knew different people who were into differential geometry. <laughs> they told me, "Oh yeah, our stuff's really used by physicists." Yeah, but but, but I guess the, the point is that like the computation stuff is not so important as learning how to think correctly. Yeah, like what good? I think Richard Feynman has a really great example of this. Where he talks about that that joke he played with the with the, uh, the the curve. If you go to the bottom of it, it's flat or something. I can't remember exactly. But uh, on his classmates, and all it was is like the flat point. The minimum of the the function is the derivative where it's zero. And it's so much more useful because only now recently probably going back and seeing it and then like really working to get ahead of my starting to understand what in the world is calculus for right but no one no one really like learns that they learn calculator living yeah. calculated derivative calculating an integral you know it wasn't until I, I came across this guy Cal Azad and I'll, I'll send you his, his Twitter he's got a great book mm -hmm. um called better better explaining the intuition behind calculus and then uh, better explain just like a few math concepts explain that no one takes the time to explain or whatever mm. and one of the, the big ideas I took from them I was like wait are you are you telling me that an integral is just the multiplication of a, of the changing domain and the range and and that's why and the derivatives is your derivative is just breaking it up that that's why it's the change and why I'm the change in x and I'm like wait a second how useful is that and and I never knew that or, or you're telling me that wait a second Pythagorean theorem uh, uh the Pythagorean theorem right a squared b squared c squared you tell me that's just a measure of distance the wonder of variance is squared and standard deviation is square root. It's the distance from the mean, right? So all these ideas, and, and you're just taught them, like, just learn how to do it. And when you're oh, given yeah. a problem, figure it out. Instead of actually knowing what are, like, we, in, in optics, I learned Euler's formula. And all these ways of, like, using the imaginary numbers to show how, oh, yeah. how a, a polarizer bends light. And I just did it, right? Because I'm like, all right, it's just a computation problem. But I didn't know what I was looking at until I took some real time looking. I was like, wait a second. Why didn't you spend the... And it wouldn't have taken long. It's uh, certainly not with, with like, sophomore... Well, not certainly not with junior level physics students, anyhow. Yeah. To explain that an imaginary number represents rotation off the number line. From a for a physics standpoint, yeah. and I'm like that would have made that would have made everything with polarization and bending the electromagnetic field a lot easier to deal with if you had just explained why I keep showing up. Like, and then everyone's just like, okay, here's an imaginary number. What do we do with it? Oh and yeah. No one, no one takes the time to explain what these things represent. They just want you to crunch them. But a computer can do that, oh, and I'm yeah. never going to be better than a computer. No, it's... But that's the thing. Up until about 40 years ago, you would have been. Right. And that's the thing about 300 years of people teaching things the same way. And, and, and worse, it was actually that stuff, being able to grind those numbers, was incredibly useful to engineers. Because, you know, like if you're building a bridge or, or things like that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you know, even arcing projectiles, anything like that, you know, designing guns, arcing projectiles, you know, more recently making things that fly, any of that stuff, like, being able to actually compute the integrals by hand was really useful to the engineers doing this. And for, for it's funny, like, traditions can build up in remarkably short periods of time. <laughs> if a tradition keeps up for a few hundred years, it takes a long time to get rid of. Right. And, um... Yeah, so I, that, especially you know, ac academia is very, very slow moving and very. And not only notch. that, there is a a vested interest, and I don't think the professors. I'll even go as far as say I don't think the most university heads and chairs are consciously aware of it, but there's a vested interest in making sure people don't realize 
yo, computers can do all of this better. We need to become better thinkers in general. Like, I'm in a class right now. I'm in numerical analysis. I don't know if you had to take that. Apparently, it's a math, computer science, hybrid class. I asked my buddy about it, who's a math major. He was like, I've never heard of that. Take probability and statistics. All right. Uh, but I'm in it. and, and That's approximating functions, right? Right. Yeah. With, with programs, because... Yeah. For a human to do this stuff would be... Miserific. Yes. And, and, you know, like, when I look at the solutions, I'm like, why would you give me the... I mean, and I get it, right? Because my job is to to program and figure this out and to come up with approximated solutions. <laughs> but but the point is, why, why though? Why? Like, teach me... But, but I guess that's why it's a 300-level course. I think the idea is that you understand this math and you could do it by hand, but now let's put the computer to work to solve some of our more complicated problems. Yeah, well, and computers have only been good at that for about 30 years. Huh. I mean, well, and I mean you know, if you look at performance 30 years ago, you would have needed like a several million dollar computer to be able to do that. MATLAB still sometimes takes forever to crunch some stuff. Like we were, we were doing interpolation spleens. And I'm like, man, MATLAB is really taking a long time to give me what I need. Yeah. But well, and if you look at computers in the 1960s, modern, like a modern desktop computer is in the range of a few million times faster. So if you think about, you know, you know a computer from the 1960s simply couldn't do those sort of calculations. Right. Um, you know, a human would beat them. You know, by, by doing a, a symbolic solution, you know, and then just plugging in the numbers to the symbolic solution, the human would, would have beaten the pants off of a computer. You know, a computer would take months and months to do what a human could do in a few minutes back then. And I think, I think just you're, on, you're on to something really big because I think, yeah, that's got to be the future of education because, like, linear algebra, for example. Linear algebra gives people fits. Fortunately, I'm a bad student. And that means that Okay, I could memorize this stuff. Uh, though that won't work. It takes too much time. Or I can figure out little tricks and what I'm seeing. And what I realized looking at linear algebra is, wait a second. This is just a way to describe reality. Like, like literally, like, okay, like, like, like this, I'm in differential equations right now. And we're talking about how do we determine uh, if a, what, uh, homogeneous function with coefficients is independent or not. And we do that by calculating something called the Ronskin. I was like, wait a second. I'm not going to memorize why. I'm not going to learn what this means, right? Because I know, I know this is just a thing a computer could tell me. So my first thought was like, okay, what is and I spent a lot of time looking. What is the Ron scheme? Once I found out what the Ron scheme was, I was like, "Wait a second. So, so right. If if there's a number, then it is linearly independent. If you get a, a even if you get zero, it's not. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, I'm just taking the dis, the determinant of of a matrix, and that is just representing whether a thing has volume or area. So wait a second. Okay, so if it's linear and linearly independent, then it must have different lines to create a three-dimensional space. So of course it has a volume. So of course the Ronson is going to have a number. But if there is no volume, then it's just, a, it's just there's nothing there. There's nothing. I mean, we, we can say all the points are dependent on one another because they're one point. Now, I don't know like how mathematically accurate that is, but the intuition for me to go okay because i remember when i seen that concept before i was like i don't want to memorize and because i feel like my memory would be faulty i might see a number and think okay there's a number there that definitely means it's not dependent because zero just means stuff right in your mind but now that i know what i'm looking at i'm like oh boom 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 whatever right yeah no i i agree with you actually the thing is i can tell you why they teach it this way mostly well, well, there's masters. Really great teachers simply love what it means and don't really care very much about how to grind through the numbers. So they often, really great teachers are often not very good academics. Right. Um, and, uh, <laughs> That's so funny you say that, yeah. 
And the thing is, they will teach you what it means. They'll teach you how to see it. And they may well end up with a class where a lot of people fail. Because um, the... the and, and here's sort of where we come to. This is the thing. If you, understanding is not normally distributed. Uh, you, you know, um, you know, bell curve distribution. Right. No. Um, it is not normally distributed. And the problem is, grades and classes need to be normally distributed. If you teach understanding and test understanding, you'll get a very bimodal distribution. You'll get a lot of Fs, and you'll get a, you'll get a few As. Yeah. And for the mo- and especially the lower down you go, you know, the more the more you're in university settings, you know, like towards grad school and stuff, the, the more most people will understand because you've just selected away everyone who's going to fail. Yeah. Um, but especially in general, and, and enough people go to college, it's a fairly general thing. Um, you know, at the undergraduate level, um, it's like fifty percent of people attend in in the U.S. Like fifty percent of people attend, and thirty percent actually graduate with a four year degree. Of something, I, and I'm surprised it's that low, fifty percent. Either it's it, these numbers were a few years ago when okay, I looked. So them it's up. good, it's going up then for sure. Yeah. It, it might well be, yeah. Uh, but um, and by the time you're talking about that much, of the population. So the thing is, if you teach and test such that you get most people failing. And, you know, basically a few people getting an A is your dean is going to hate you. Or your principal is going to hate right. you if you're lower down. So you have to do something that will produce a normal grade distribution. Memory, however, is normally distributed amongst the population. If you teach people a whole lot of facts and just have them spit them back at you, you're in a timed environment, you're going to get a... You're testing memory, basically. Right. If you test memory, you're going to get a normal distribution in terms of outcomes, which gives you the great distribution you're supposed to have. Right. And I think it is a horrible way to do things. Oh, it is. I don't... I, I fear... Because I had this awakening, because I took a semester off, and I spent a lot of it working on just shoring up my weak spots. This is right around the point where I found um, Khalid Azad. I hope I'm saying his name right. That'd be embarrassing. But 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 I, I love his guys right. He'll be he'll forgive me, I hope. Uh this is right around the time where I found him and his writing and what he's explaining and it was a whole new way for me to look at math and I was like it's really important to know what you're doing otherwise Otherwise, this is the same as, like, writing a paper. You're just putting words down. It's actually worse. You don't even know. You're just going through it because someone said this will get you a great paying job. This will get you, like, for example. It's right? true, too, about a great paying job. But. Yeah. Like, I sat through I sat through my le- three different instructions of electronics, one with the military, one in my associate's degree, and a 300-level electronics class for physics. And not a single professor made the connection to me. And it would have been this simple to go, we label resistors on increasing, you know, magnitudes of 10 based on the colors of the rainbow. And it's such a simple realization, right? His students wow. ripped their hair out trying to remember uh, the order of, you know, they, they got all these sayings like, oh, our, our big boys raise girls and stuff like that for the cause. And I'm like... Wait a second, I, I'm just looking at this, I'm like, red, orange, yellow, <laughs> blue, green, indigo, violet, and then you got brown and black at the beginning, which, which makes perfect sense, um, and then silver at the end. <laughs> no one, no one? Really? And, wow. And, I, I've never done electronics, but I, wow. Oh my, and you, you see it in every single field, like, everyone, um... What are some what are my favorite math realizations that, that that popped into my mind? Really simple ones. Oh, here's a really simple one, right? I'm I'm explaining to the kid, one of the kids I tutor, I'm like, okay, what do you get when you divide by a fraction? You you're effectively multiplying it by its denominator, right? But I don't I didn't I wasn't satisfied with that answer because that's a memorization point. So instead, I thought about it, and I was like, okay, if it takes you an hour to dig a hole, how long does it take you to dig half a hole? (laughs) And of course, she goes 30 minutes, and I go, no, you can't dig half a hole, right? (laughs) But what you can do is dig at a rate twice as fast, and get, and if you do that, you will be halfway where you were at the same point. 
So take that idea and you want to remember all you're saying is, oh, I'm going to half the time, but I'm really digging twice as fast. So you have to multiply the thing that would have given you half. Now I don't want you to remember a fraction. Remember that whole analogy. You know, whatever these pizzas, I was like, if you got a pizza and you divide it by half. Uh, but, the, but the whole idea is like, why are we teaching rote computation? Like you said, the computer does it better. Yeah, the computer does it faster. I, I feel like, like, like I, feel, I feel like I really understood calculus when it all hit me that dy over dx literally was the change in y divided by the change in x, the a, a division problem, and <laughs> integral was a multiplication of the the points on a function each little y multiplied by these little x, and now that's why it's area. And now it's like, oh, okay. So when we, when we enter, do a triple integral, we're just getting the volume of the thing. Right? They just yeah. go to do a triple integral. Or, or, or you know, and that, now my new thing I really want to dig into is, like, all the series stuff that, that people hate in Calc 2. Uh Oh, what did we do for it? And and I had, and and I and why did I start going back to it? Because in optics, there were these problems that required the use of the Taylor series mm. to explain. And I'm like, all right, I don't really remember this, but I but this is just a little too complicated for me to just create stuff on my own. So I, I started going back, and the first thing I looked at was linear approximation. And instead of like trying to remember, it's, it's like the square root of eight point four, right? Well, let's let's see what it looks like on the function of eight, you know, square root of eight, and then we're gonna keep getting closer and closer by adding the derivative and then jumping back and then subtracting that part and then jump back and adding. Like no no no, instead of looking at a picture, bro, here's one point, here's another point. We're trying to guess what this point is, so let's pick a point a little closer and and see what we get. And and it's that kind of stuff. Mm. They're just saying, all right, here's a linear approximation problem, figure it out. Now now you know maybe maybe I'm the idiot. Uh, maybe everyone gets this, but talking to some of my classmates, I know not everyone. Yeah, <laughs> they don't. And you know, it, it, it's asking the right question, not coming up with the answer. The right question is why in the world is it being taught like this? Why are we why are we be just giving information instead of like pouring over and trying to figure out stuff? Why? Yeah. Well, I, I th there's history. I, I having asked myself the same questions, yes. I've been through <laughs> a, a lot. Of Funny thing is, people only ever talk about evolution in, in like a historical context. They never think about it in a present context. But here's the thing: if there there there's selective pressures all over the world that mm -hmm. produce result, and so, um, you know, for a teacher, if you are considered to be a good teacher, if you produce particular grade distributions, and you know you're likely to get promoted and so on, versus if you're considered a bad teacher, you may even lose your job for producing different grade distributions. And having known a few really, really good teachers who always struggle because their grade distributions are terrible and way too many students fail, um, and then they get, you know, bad reviews and so on. Right. The few students who do really well love the heck out of them, you know, because they're teaching understanding and so they get that bimodal grade distribution. Yeah. And so there are few students who absolutely love the heck out of them, and a lot of students are wondering, why am I failing this class when I passed all the rest of my classes? <laughs> I should be a solid, you know, C plus, B minus student. Well... That's a pressure against that sort of teaching. Whenever you have selective pressures, that produces an evolutionary effect. That is to say, people who, for whatever reason, conform tend to do better. People who, for whatever reason, don't conform <laughs> tend to do worse. Well, you're evolving teachers who will grade people along the some sort of normal distribution. Line, right. Memory happens to be, in addition to being traditional, normally distribu distributed. It gives you a, a good grade distribution that everybody around you loves you for. And so there's a heavy selective pressure on being that sort of teacher. And um, I actually have a, a, a blog post about this. I called it the, the fundamental principle of science, which is assume anything necessary in order to publish. Ah, uh, you know, it's a man, we, one of those core classes that I got to take I'm, uh, is about scientific writing. And we're, we're on a section about, we just watched a bunch of lectures. And, this is a distance class, thank goodness. <laughs> About the whole business, I mean business, I mean, I, I call it a hustle personally, but the whole business of 
getting papers published and the impact factor and how to raise that through some shady means and it, well <laughs> even on, even on a more basic level and, and biology is great for this because biology is so complicated no one understands it very well so if you simply assume for example that everybody reacts the same way to the same food it makes your experiment much much easier to design mm-hmm. this may be a completely unjustified assumption you may have no reason whatever to assume this but if you do, you can conduct the experiment with the budget that you have, and you have something to publish. Yeah. If you are more rigorous and think, well, I can't, I just, I don't have the budget to control this, what do I do? You haven't published anything. And, and so, yeah, there's publish or perish, but more to the point, science consists entirely of what is published. Because what people never publish, nobody knows no. about. <laughs> right. There is a selective pressure for publishing. Being the sort of person who will make unjustified assumptions that make you more likely to publish something gets you ahead. And here's the thing, I'm not talking about a temptation. This isn't about people's honesty. This isn't about, like, you know, will I take a shortcut? If you're just the sort of fool who will assume all sorts of things away for no good reason, (laughs) you've got lots to publish. Yeah. Same thing actually goes uh, for political reporting. If you're the sort of idiot who cannot understand what other people are saying, you always have something to be outraged about today. Right. And so, like, and, and that is, but that is a, a great source, or our inspiration, rather, for my political apathy, is I sit here, and I look at a story, and my mind always asks the same questions, and rarely are they answered. I'm like, okay, or rarely are they answered. It's like, all right, so, is that exactly what they said? For that, that is that is always my first question. I don't care about your interpretation. Just tell me exactly what was said. If that's exactly what was said, was it in context or was it always or is that the statement, right? Because man, they're they're really good at separating and, and taking stuff out and, and showing you what you what they want to see to make their case, right? Oh yes, and the thing is. The bias always goes in one direction. It always goes in in favor of this statement is more significant than it actually was. Oh, right. No one ever downplays something. Like, you know, he probably didn't mean it. There's no news in there, right? Exactly. You don't write articles about person, you know, famous person says nothing anyone's interested in. Right. (laughs) No. That's not an article. If you have enough sense to understand that such a, you know, whatever statement actually was completely inconsequential it means nothing of any importance you don't write an article the the idiot however who doesn't understand that has an article to go write right they get clicks they get advertising we got such a there was such a big deal um about about i guess donald trump and his tax returns and i'm sitting here looking at this going why in the world does is this information relevant <laughs> Like I, I, I just like I couldn't care. I, I wanted to care, but I couldn't find a reason to. And that's, I mean, maybe that's like being overly ra- being rational, which is a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. But at the same time, like, you when you look at a world like that, right? It's, it, I always, I always try to avoid taking the arrogant assumption about myself, and and thinking that my way is best. So I'm like, maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe it tells me something. So, I mean, I really dug deep. And I'm like, there is nothing this will make. It doesn't tell us anything. It's just a thing. And, and and because he didn't do a thing, now everyone's got something right about. Yeah. So we got to keep this thing stoked as long as possible because this equals views. Views equals dollars. <laughs> well, and the fundamental problem of news is that the world produces news at whatever rate it wants to produce news. Right. Which is not at all... You know, I mean, that's the thing about that, like being a coal miner. There's a lot of coal on the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's the thing about being a bricklayer. You can get tons of bricks, you know, and... and but, but, like, news... Well, the world only produces it at whatever rate it wants, and some days are slow news days. Right. Uh, but, but at the same time, right... I don't. I don't think there. Days. are... I don't think that there are slow news days. I think there are s- slow, insignificant, or slow, significant news days. I think. Well, that's there what are I some, mean. Yeah, there are some days where where you know the cops shot somebody and somebody refused to do a thing and maybe somebody dropped the N word and and there was some statement made against immigrants and then like nothing. 
for months because they're, they're like they're the hot wars. They're the, the situations that people. The big thing today, right? I was just looking through. I always wake up. I, I've learned now that I don't ever need to read a news article. <laughs> I can just skim Twitter and see whatever. That's really yeah. if if it's. If it's if it's showing up repeatedly in different forms, I'm like maybe this is an interesting story. So I heard the big things that I know about today. I know that Dave Chappelle pissed off trans people in his in his latest act, and I know that in Rockville, Maryland, two immigrants raped a girl. That those are the two things I know. Like those, that that's the news that everyone has jumped on, and that's what's trending out there. So those will be the news stories for the next. Everything around, everything will revolve around that somehow because I mean, those are juicy news bits. I mean, those are things we can really get clicks. It doesn't matter what significant stuff happens. Like, there's a whole joke like, "What really, what really went on today?" If they're they're giving us this, I don't even I don't even think there's a conspiracy anymore to like disguise news. I just think people they select what they want to see. It is it is voting. It is it is yeah, it's voting. And they go, we want to we, we want to hear about the, the bad jokes Dave Chappelle made. Who cares if there is a solution to water? Who cares if bros? I think I think something big was going on, something ridiculous. And and what was the other story that was going on? There were like Russian subs outside of Delaware, and I'm like, that's probably more important. <laughs> I, I'll remember exactly what it was eventually. Uh, but, but yeah, they were they were talking about all, all these things that were in, inconsequential but fun. And then yeah. and then stories kept popping up about these slubs of like eighty miles off the coast of Delaware. And I'm like, maybe we should address that one. Maybe people should know. But yeah, well, it, that said, I mean, the funny thing is, if you ever look at history books, virtually nothing that ever shows up in newspapers matters. Like five years later. Yep. <laughs> it's just a day to day to distraction. Uh, it is. Well, and the thing is, people publishing the news compete with. Video games. They compete with going for a walk. They compete with having a conversation with a friend. Have you ever seen uh, <laughs> Anchorman Two? No. They do a wonderful bit of social commentary on this because the whole plot about Anchorman Two is that the news is dying, and then they <laughs> figure out by accident, showing video of this this car chase, that people are tuning in. So like, <laughs> so now like all the news is about. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, are, are things unrelated to just pure reporting? It's got to be something sensational, and that's exactly what it is. And and I think it's so funny that that, that they were able to make them. Now they made the joke in a way that was comfortable for everybody who watches, yeah. uh, and who watches TV in Hollywood. And, and but the, but the joke, the point was not lost on me. I was like, man, this is, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, and we we should actually get to the. Um, the the uh, other conversation about uh, um, b- before you have to go to, you know talking about making things intelligible. Oh um, right, I thought uh, this was part of that. So I just... Oh, I didn't actually. Uh, well, I didn't do the introduction yet. Actually. Oh okay. Uh, I can always edit. Um, but but uh, sorry. The, the um, but the funny thing about evo- the evolutionary thing too, you know, there, there's selective pressures on you know people who will publish news stories about you know whatever Dave Chappelle said, you know, but then. These people form the people that new people have to work with. Right. And so you get multi generational selection effects because who's willing to work? You know, so, so you have, you know, somebody who's got, you know, they, they get tons of clicks. You know, they get, they get big, um, you know, ton, tons of advertising revenue, tons of clicks because they're publishing sensationalist stuff. Who wants to work with them? Because it's not like the people who apply for jobs, you know, are, are, are you know, blindfolded and have earmuffs on right. the whole time and have no clue who they're applying to it for a job. Yeah. Only some people want to work with these sorts of people. Only some people see, you know, really sensationalist news stories of probably no consequence and think, I want to write that. (laughs) So now you've got, you know, your next generation of people who have been selected for wanting to do this sort of thing, for wanting to work with these sort of people. But now, you you know, then you have the next generation who see these sort of things that those people, you know, the second generation did, because they will act a bit differently... Who wants to work with them? You know, who wants that sort of person as a boss? Who can stand that sort of job for any length of time before they quit and find something better? So that that's where you really see the evolutionary effects. And it's something I've noticed whenever I talk about this. Like, people always think I'm talking about individual temptation. You know, like, well, I could be honest, but maybe I'd get more clicks. I'm not talking about that at all. Because, I mean, yeah, a few people will experience that. 
there'll be lots of people who it flies right over their head. Right. It's never it's never a temptation for them. They don't even know what's going on. They're just doing it. <laughs> they do wonderfully in that sort of job because they sleep very well. They never have a single qualm. They it's never have just, a second it's, thought. It's what they're there to do. Exactly. It's, and then who works with those people well? The con and they're going to hire those, and then the whole cycle continues. And next thing you know, you got something we'll called call salon, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this shows up, and they don't care. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Hi. I hope you saw the interview I did with Ed Lattimore the other day, where we talked about making wisdom intelligible and, and some other things. Now, a uh, funny thing about that interview is that Ed and I had been talking uh, bef before we got started, and then I started recording, but then we just continued with the conversation we'd been having. And that kept going, actually, for quite a while. Um, close to 40 minutes or so before I finally, uh, took a break to, um, you know, pause to actually do a proper introduction and get on to the actual, um, subject I had, you know, asked him that I could interview him about. Um, so I want to take this, uh, stuff, the, the first stuff that happened, um, and sort of present that as a bonus because on different subjects, interesting subjects, I think, and Ed's cool with that. So, um, here you go. Here's the conversation Ed and I were having before the interview. Let me start. But, you know, it's funny. I was talking with, um, with someone who's another math person. And um, there's actually a video I did on um, Bayesian statistics versus frequentist statistics. I don't know if you've ever heard of... It. It's, I it's know a, what, the, what Bayes' theorem is in Bayesian statistics. And I'd imagine it's a little... Is it related at all? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It is. It's an interpret... There's... There, there are two sort of interpretations of statistics. Because, um, I mean, the problem with statistics is that in, in frequent statistics, um, which is looking at probabilities as the limits of infinite sequences, mm -hmm. the real world doesn't actually satisfy any of the conditions necessary to apply probability to it. Right. So that's why I joke that statistics is the misapplication of probability to the real world. Because... Nobody has an infinite run of anything. <laughs> so any theorem that says if you have an infinite run of these things, well, you don't, so you're supposed to stop there. Okay. Uh, Bayesian statistics, by contrast, or the Bayesian interpretation, um, and it's, I think, partially named for Bayes' theorem. I'm not sure it was the... He actually mentioned it, too, because he's really interested... He, he has the math background, too. He's really interested in Bayesian statistics. And I think he said... Um, it's like the Reverend Thomas Bayes, or like he's actually an English priest, um, who was uh, really interested in betting and how you, you know, to, to bet in the most optimal way. Yeah. Um, as, as an intellectual problem, I believe. And uh, but anyway, um, the Bayesian interpretation is that that probably it, we're, um, we're not deriving probabilities from uh, the long-term trends in, or the trends in infinite series or the limits of infinite series properly, uh, but rather they're simply prior assumptions about the world, largely modeling how confident are we that something will happen. So the, the probability is hmm. a measure of our confidence, not a, you know, not anything more than that. Um, and so Bayesian statistics is, more than anything from what he was saying, um, more about figuring out how to evaluate your prior assumptions rather than your, they call them your priors, but they, the condition, the probability you apply to, to base things, because um, then what they do, or, you know, as you said, like using base, uh, Bayes theory, which is about you know conditional chaining conditional probabilities, or that's what conditional probability is, but chaining probabilities together, you know, the probability of this given that, mm -hmm. um, that you then run those calculations, see how likely things are to occur, see what actually does occur, and. To a large degree, what you can then do is go back and figure out that you were probably wrong about your priors. So is Bayesian more of a experimental base, and the other one, what was it, frequent? Frequentist. Frequentist statistics is more theoretic. Um, they're they're two, they're attitudes more than anything else, because everybody uses the same formulas. Okay. 
Um, it's just a Bayesian will happily say, I'm guessing the probability of this is 0.137, whereas a frequentist will want some sort of process that they can model in terms of long-term limits. Okay. I was um, trying to explain that to a kid. I, I, uh, one of the kids I tutored, and I was like, oh, the, the idea, I was teaching her about ratios and uh, odds and probability of one thing happening, all in a context of betting, which is a great way to teach anything related to probability. Yeah. And I would say, well, what, the, what this is really saying is that if you could do somehow do this an infinite number of times, it would approach uh, the, the frequency of one thing happening versus